And so for hundreds of years of European history, actually, people didn't know about the towns or they knew about them, but they didn't know where. They were sort of forgotten until they were discovered in the 1700s. It was some Italian well diggers who found this villa on what they thought were the outskirts of Herculaneum. Um, and they, they kind of started digging down and they struck this uh, marble paving stone, which was part of, I think, a walkway leading up to the villa. And the spirit of the time was, um, you know, I think everyone looked back on this ancient Roman period as a time of sort of civilizational greatness and great beauty. Brent, it would be good. I think you've told us in that this um, a few times, so I apologize for asking you to repeat uh, history, but it'd be good to understand uh, a little bit about yourself, um, your sort of career and the initial success you had uh, at En Gedi. Um, to begin with, and then we can sort of take it from there. Yeah, that, that initial success was actually hard won after a lot of failure uh, because we, we sort of uh, conceived the method after we'd done, you know, a, a sort of 2D problem of virtual flattening. And, and we just thought, without knowing the material, we thought, how about virtual unwrapping, you know, like in full 3D? You know, it's sort of an engineer's way to look at it. and. We built that out without any material really to apply it to. And it was the Herculaneum material that we came to, which unfortunately is the hardest material to, you know, sort of crack. And so after hammering away at Herculaneum for, oh, a half a decade, uh, maybe more, uh, at the end Getty scroll came to us through having, having tried really hard and built a reputation from Herculaneum, uh, the Israelis uh, ha had read about our work and thought, well, we can't do anything with this scroll from Engedi, so let's see if uh, the SEALs research team can take a crack at it. So that's so, actually how it came to us. Do you, Before then, uh, when you say SEALs research team, is the is that like the SEAL Team 6 of, uh, <laughs> of archaeology and unwrapping? You know that uh, university research is always a moving target. People don't stay, they move through, they matriculate, they get their degrees. So... Uh, you know, you, you give it the name of the guy who's been willing to stay here the longest and that's me. Right. So you're right. Like, you're like probably on seal team 75 or something. Yeah, there you go. So, um, how did you end up starting, uh, even pre and Getty then, how did you end up sort of working and selecting to work on the Herculaneum stuff? We, we built out this software with, uh, examples we made in the lab that we had scanned in a, a medical scanner. It basically pushed uh, a proof of concept all the way through from scanning to virtual unwrapping. We were super excited. We're like, this is a scroll I made and I can read it. Um, so then we started asking classicists, you know, so what's the, what's the material that this could work on? And Richard Janko, um, after a year's delay, he waited a year to answer my email. Yeah, a year. Um, and when he did, he's, he's saying to me, this is, this is so cool and I'm very enthusiastic and I have to take you to, uh, Herculaneum and to Naples and so forth and so on. So he was really the one who educated me in the classical way of, you know, this is the material, here's where it came from. And let me show you, he showed me in person what the material looked like. So that was 2005, first time I saw anything from Herculaneum. So 2005. Is you, uh, you visited Herculaneum or you saw the Herculaneum artifacts for the first That's time. That's right. And um, what was sort of the pitch then? W were they, had, had they tried other methods of sort of unwrapping them and been unsuccessful or were they not even aware of what they were sort of looking at? So they'd had a breakthrough in 99 and the year 2000 with the team from Brigham Young where they had discovered that uh, spectral imaging, in particular, uh, imaging with, with infrared light gave great contrast on the things that had already been opened. And so they were, they were already moving toward new technology, which was right. great because that needed to happen. But, right. but prior to that, they had invested a lot of time with the Oslo method. And I, I can't for the life of me understand why, because I've seen what, the fragments. What is the uh, Oslo method? So it was a a chemistry based method for physically unwrapping scrolls. And they, and they let the lead, uh, researcher from Oslo, uh, his name's Cleve. 
K-L-E-V-E. And I may not be saying that right. I've never met him, but uh, they let him unwrap more than 40 scrolls in that method. And, and almost none of them came out in a way that is even as good as Piaget's method. I mean, they're just all fragmentary. And they did that consistently through the 80s until finally there was a moratorium. And then the Brigham Young team, and then I entered the scene. So that was sort of the context of which mostly I was unaware when I entered the scene. I was a, a new researcher and um, had an idea. And uh, as you know, when you walk into these kinds of landscapes, you don't instantly know everything that's going on, right? So that sounds familiar yeah. for me right now. <laughs> um, that makes sense. And, and so I, I believe if I uh, was reading correctly, the papyri themselves, the Herculaneum papyri were discovered in 1752. Is that right? Um, yeah. And, and so walk, it would be interesting to understand. So these sort of scrolls are discovered in 1752, right next to Mount Vesuvius. And I guess you, you, you described a bunch, but how many sort of different teams tried, you know, various arcane or not things over the years in order to sort of unwrap them or understand what's inside them? Well, of course, I'm not an expert in, in the history and, um, the, the, uh, the classicists who are reading this material, especially David Blank from UCLA, I've heard him lecture on this, knows all of the ins and outs of the century or two that happened. But I mean, initially they didn't even know that they were writing. They thought that they were logs or charcoal. They were unknown artifacts. So. Uh, untold numbers of scrolls were burned or thrown away before someone realized. So that those were the early days. Someone realized there's actually writing in here, you know, after, after that, Nat, maybe you can jump in because I think you're pretty familiar with the. the yeah. History. I mean, um, you know, it's funny reading about that discovery was sort of, uh, after Vesuvius erupted in AD 79 and kind of covered all these nearby towns of, uh, Pompeii and Herculaneum and Boscoriali with this, what they call pyroclastic flow, this kind of combination of mud, hot mud and ash that fell. Um, and, uh, you know, I was sort of surprised to learn this, but it wasn't like a few feet. It was like 50 or 60 or 65 feet of stuff. So this, these places were buried quite, depending on sort of the wind and the slope of the volcano, where you were different levels of depth, buried very deep. And so for hundreds of years of European history, actually people didn't know about the towns or they knew about them, but they didn't know where they were sort of forgotten until they were discovered in the 1700s. And then, uh, it was some Italian well diggers who found this villa on what they thought were the outskirts of Herculaneum. Um, and they, they kind of started digging down and they struck this, uh, marble paving stone, which was part of, I think, a walkway leading up to the villa. And the spirit of the time was, um, you know, I think everyone looked back on this ancient Roman period as a time of sort of civilizational greatness and great beauty. And so there was kind of a spirit of like looting in a way, I think among these early discoverers where they were really just lo looking for treasure, like great marble, you know, bronze statues and beautiful objects they could pull out and adorn their, their homes or the homes of their patrons with. And, uh, and they found a lot. They, they were very lucky, especially in hitting yeah. this villa. It was full of stuff. I mean, I've got this amazing book here. Um, we, we've got some links on the website to different great books. And, you know, one of the fun things about this for me is just like falling down the rabbit hole of all this information and history. But uh, they found in this particular villa, like hundreds, um, hundreds, maybe an exaggeration, but certainly dozens of like beautiful bronze bronzes. And so, and they, and the spirit was, they would find these things and keep, and, and they were not exposing the villa to the air they were digging tunnels um because it was just way too much dirt to move and so they're exploring like coal miners in tunnels and then occasionally hitting a you know a statue or even a wall of the villa and if they hit a wall they would just bore through it uh, so this was not a careful preservative conservators archaeology it was a treasure hunt and uh and then you know as as uh, brent said they would occasionally encounter these and i've got We've made some mock-ups when Brent was in town. We we mocked a few of these things up. So they encountered, you know, this is, I think they were coiled more tightly and even more distorted than this, but they'd find these sort of things lying around and I guess discarded many of them. And then, yeah, as to the kind of attempts to open them, um, the early people who got their hands on them, there was the Swiss engineer who was doing the exploration. Um, 
you know, to the ones that they didn't discard, they, they did like incredibly primitive things to try to open them. They like cut them open with daggers and try to scrape the layers away to try to see if they could see words. Um, they dipped them in water to try to soften them because what happens when you try to open them is they just kind of flake apart in your hand, like pieces just come off. Um, and the especially carbonized Herculaneum scrolls really just fall apart. And then in the, I think 17, late 1700s, um, or just a few years in, there was an Italian monk named, uh, Piaggio who worked for the Vatican. I think the Vatican kind of took control of the situation somehow. They gave him custody of these scrolls and he developed this intricate machine that used like, I think cat gut or something like that and weights and pig's bladders to sort of soften the scrolls and very, very slowly and carefully unrolled them over, you know, years, actually, uh, something like half a centimeter a day. And this was not an, this was still a destructive method. I think, you know, not everything came out well, but it was by far the most effective method that had been used up to that point. And they were able to unroll a number of them and read them and discover what they were for the first time, which was that a group of these contained these Greek, Greek philosophical writings from an Epicurean philosopher who was named Philodemus. And in fact, they found so much of his stuff there that they concluded um, that it was likely that this little room in which many of them were found was actually his kind of like working library. Um, and so, uh, and so there's, yeah, so there's many attempts to do this. And then, you know, Brent told me actually that several scrolls, I didn't, you know, I didn't know this until he told me, but quite recently, but the, uh, that there were even recent attempts in the, I think the two thousands to open some of these things with chemical methods and physical methods that were quite destructive as well. Um, and so there's like hundreds of years of history of, you know, it's almost like thinking back on early medicine, lobotomies or something like this, like this, you know, like very, very primitive physical stuff that, you know, maybe did more harm than good in many cases. And, um, you mentioned a little bit of some sort of conclusions of what might be, uh, ultimately in store. Um, what, what, what are sort of your base case conclusions of what might be actually, you know, encoded inside the scrolls of Herculaneum and what's your sort of most extreme upside scenario? Uh, I'll give my take. And, you know, I think we have, we've all got our different hopes and dreams here. And I think the mystery is part of what makes it so fun. Um, cause we don't know, you know, like it could be so many different things. Um, I think the base case is it's probably more Greek philo philosophy and Epicurean philosophy in particular. And I think the Epicureans, it's not the most salient of the ancient Roman philosophy to us today. We like Stoicism better, for example. I think the Epicureans and the Stoics were maybe not enemies, but, you know, didn't subscribe to quite the same beliefs. Um, and uh, so, and then Philodemus himself, I think, you know, maybe not even the best Epicurean philosopher. So, um, they found like a leaping piglet bronze statue in this villa, which was one of the symbols of the Epicureans and, you know, like a drunken Bacchus and other things like this. And so there's, there's signs that the people of this villa were Epicureans in some way. And so it's possible that, you know, in the base case, we just find more of that. Uh, Philodemus' stuff, which was mostly not known or, you know, we didn't have a lot of it until these papyri were dug up. Um, is often most interesting in the places where he quotes the Stoics in order to try to refute them. And we get this new Stoic text that people are excited about, but, uh, but I think it's cool anyway. I mean, he has like all these crazy books, um, you know, uh, like he has books about how to refute arguments and, uh, you know, he has these works. One of them is like how to manage, uh, residential properties or something like that. And so I think it's all really interesting. So I think that's the base case. Um, my upside case is, um, yeah, I don't know, something that rewrites history in some way, right? Like some, some set of facts that refutes our current understanding of what, ha what has happened to the world. Um, you know, we've only got maybe 1% of ancient writing. And so imagine if, you know, you only got 1% of, you know, what was written in the 20th century, um, to try to write the history of the 20th century really just depends on which 1% you got, what you would think happened. And so, uh, if we're able, you know, basically we're able to apply, um, Brent's techniques to these scrolls and, and do it at scale and have it work, then we could as much as double 
you know, from like 1% to 2%, maybe more, all the text that we have from antiquity. I can't see how that wouldn't change our understanding of the facts. And so um, the extreme upside case is, you know, I, I, I've, these are Brent, rumors. Uh, yeah, Brent, uh, you told us some, some sort of rumors that have been whispered throughout history of in the extreme upside scenario. What do you think might be there it, with the understanding, of course, that it, I don't know. No one really knows. Right. Well, certainly lost works, you know, that, that are referred to, but that we just don't have, um, would be amazing. Um, I've always said, uh, anything related to the emergence of, uh, the new, new Testament. Um, we know that the apostle Paul was in the area, uh, right at that time, hey. early Christian material. I mean, the dating is definitive. We don't have. We don't really have anything from the first century. And I have to believe, you know, one of the reasons the Vatican got so eager is because they also were thinking, you know, there may be some Christian material here. Nobody really knew. Of course, they were all classically trained as well. But I'm just saying, you know, uh, the Catholics were down there in an instant once they realized that they discovered this cache of, of literary material, right? So. Um, is it true that um, other libraries, uh, other sort of, famous historical libraries may have been backed up um, at Herculaneum, or do you think it's too much of a long shot to believe maybe that the Library of Alexandria um, maybe could be somehow have a backup in Herculaneum? No, I, I've heard that. I mean, I, I know they transferred things all around. I, I know that there were ships and boats that actually sunk, you know, in the, in the various uh, waterways uh, containing incredible manuscripts. And may, maybe those are still out there to find as well. But um they move things around for sure, and they had a cataloging system. So I don't think that's a long shot at all. I mean, what's a long shot is just, so I think the mystery here is understanding the range of what we have, right? Because right. we, we just have these 500 unwrapped, you know, wrapped up scrolls that are not unwrapped. And we just don't even know the landscape of what we have, right? And that would be great to know. Yeah, I mean, and there's this further upside point, which is we have hundreds of these unopenable scrolls and really don't know, it's a mystery what's in them and we hope to find out soon. But um, when they more recently excavated in the 90s, the villa kind of dug it back up a little bit or parts of it, they discovered that there were two additional stories in the villa that had not been tunneled in the original, you know, in the original tunnels. And uh, some of the classicists that, I've spoken to have speculated and they seem to have some evidence for this, that we haven't even found the main library in this villa and that there may be in fact, a much larger main library, maybe on a different floor or in another unexcavated part of the villa, uh, which could be the Roman library written in Latin, um, as opposed to these Greek Epicurean, you know, scrolls that we have. Uh, I read some of the original kind of excavation sort of firsthand accounts and there are these heartbreaking you know, passages where they talk about finding like a huge entire crate in the mud of Latin scrolls, where, which they describe as having some kind of uh, literary work, poetic, epic poem or something like that, but that they sort of destroyed them while taking them out. Either they were too fragile or, or too sloppy. Uh, and so, and then I guess there were scrolls discovered in the passageways of the villa indicating maybe that some of them were part of the probably extremely harried evacuation effort that was going on at the time. So there's some, some evidence that some of this stuff was there. And, and so, you know, my um, best case scenario for what happens here is that, you know, this project succeeds and, uh, you know, Brent's techniques and virtual unwrapping work on these scrolls and with the help of, you know, the participants in this contest, we're able to really scale that up and make it work at the level of these difficult scrolls. And then that, Proof positive causes us to get to scan all the other scrolls that are out there and archaeologists to start the dig again and uh, dig out that villa and see what else is there. Like that would be, that would be the dream. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you guys um, have a view, Brent? Maybe this is more a question for you on, you know, I noticed in the, um, a lot of the uh, Egyptian pyramids have sort of discovered new rooms through use of sort of muon tomography. Um, is there sort of a strategy or a way where we could sort of x-ray the land without having to excavate things? Or is that just sort of impossible given physics? 
You know, I actually don't know. I, I know that the, you know, the seismic work that's done in, in the oil industry and mm. with, with geology, it, it is quite advanced. And I don't know that any of that work has been done. You could certainly do it, um, you know, horizontally because you have this wall that's been excavated. Uh, and, and I just don't know that it's even been done to, to be able to tell what we could learn from that. I certainly yep. think, you know, it would be really interesting to do because we really have no idea of what's, what's back there. And the same for the villa, you know, it's, it's largely unexplored. Yeah. Um, you know, um, one thing that's happened recently is, uh, there are a lot of these machine learning techniques that are a little bit more probabilistic than they are definitive. I mean, to some extent, machine learning is always probabilistic, but sort of the computer's ability to synthesize poetry or images, um, has grown. And so how do you guys sort of think of if someone, you know, could we end up in a solution where someone has decoded something, which is sensible? Maybe it's even the most sensible thing you could decode. How would we sort of know that it is real and not sort of hallucinated by some type of very advanced machine learning algorithm? I think that's a really important point. We have to be able to inspect all the steps that go back to the original data because it all comes from whatever we've acquired as this uh, sort of first order uh, testament to what right. actually in, in the article, in the object. So, so you have to have a set of steps that allow you to trace, trace that back and then kick the tires on that. Um, I think if you end up, there's this concept in mathematics, right, of, of transverse or uh, stability when you jitter something, right? And I think that's really gonna, gonna be the key is when you move things around a little bit and the uh, algorithm still gives you sort of the same thing based on the same data, then you're probably gonna have a more robust solution. Right. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, we would discourage folks from building models that are trained on like Greek letter forms explicitly uh, yeah. because they might, you know, hallucinate letters, like whole letters. And, um, you know, we're, we're gonna, we are requiring that all sort of submissions include like all your code and all your training data. And, you know, in order to qualify, we have to be able to fully replicate your results kind of by following your steps. And then you have to therefore have been able to convince our technical review team that your method is, you know, guarding against hallucination or not prone to it. So we're, I think we're at the suitable level of paranoia about that and, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to avoid, avoid that risk. Yeah. I should add that, you know, it's really no different than what you'd like from, uh, from the old school way of, of analyzing these things where a scholar would make a decision and, uh, and then they would produce an addition and, and often the, the readers wouldn't be able to even question that. Um, so in a way, this is going to be more open than it's ever been in the sense that we'll have all the steps from the data all the way out that anyone can explore in terms of peer review. And I think that's really a good thing, you know, for the competition, of course, but also for the field, right? Right, right, totally. Um, do you, do you sort of think, um, you know, sort of one view is that, uh, the sort of raison d'etre uh, for this challenge now is, um, the, uh, these transformer models and GPT-3 and whatever, um, maybe there's sort of another view, which is the reason for this challenge now is actually the internet, uh, Kaggle, um, many people can try many different approaches from around the world, um, sort of a meritocracy. Um, what sort of camp are you guys in and. Do you sort of, is there someone sort of watching this, wondering what path to go down? What sort of high level advice would you, would you sort of give them? I mean, is this sort of a, you know, uh, use nano GPT and train your GPT model from scratch sort of thing, or should they sort of start going down different paths? You want to go ahead, Nat? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, on the why now on this, I think there's, um, you know, I think it's more the, I'd say it's more the internet. I mean. I think there's kind of two key things that have happened here. Um, the first is that Brent and his team have actually kind of made a landmark achievement very recently by demonstrating that one of the key challenges of reading these scrolls can be overcome with uh, CT scan data that they've produced. And I think that is really the thing that gives us the confidence that this 
contest can really work. And so, you know, the challenge with the Herculaneum scrolls as compared to the Engedi ones, as Brent has taught me, is that the ink in the Herculaneum scrolls doesn't really show up on x-rays. It's, you know, it's radiolucent. Right. At the term. And is that because they, they used different calligraphy methods? Yeah, I think they just used different ink. You know, I think the, I don't know exactly the materials, but I think the Engedi ink may have had some metal in it or was just denser in some ways, maybe some iron wow. or something. And the Herculaneum ink had not very much metal or, and, you know, mostly it was maybe carbon based. It, it just basically looks real similar to the papyrus. Like it doesn't show right. up as bright, you know, radio opaque, um, kind of like when you look at your bones on an x-ray, you know, um, and, uh, and so that made it much more challenging. And, you know, they had this brilliant idea of taking those infrared images that Brent mentioned earlier, and then taking CT scans, these 3D x-rays of the same, you know, broken off or fragmented detached papyrus samples that they had the images of, and using that as kind of ground truth to train a machine learning model to see if they could find some features in the CT scans that indicated the presence of ink, and it did. And that was a very recent achievement. And so I think that's sort of the first why now is like, wow, this is not some shot in the dark. This actually, yeah. the pieces are there. This, this can really work. And I think the other one is, you know, Brent um, and I kind of, I think, shared it, some excitement about this um, idea of kind of opening this to the world. And, you know, my background's open source. And I think, you know, Brent was was similarly uh, excited and open-minded about this idea of like, let's invite the world in and kind of take this thing over the finish line together. And um, so I think it's it, those things, whether you actually even need any, you know, new techniques that have been developed in the last three or to five years, I don't think we have a real strong view that that's needed. Um, but I don't yeah. know, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think we can do better. Uh, our, our proof of concept gives us confidence that it can work and that it will be solved for a long time. I wondered, um, you know, because x-ray techniques are really limiting, you know, I mean, you get this sort of transmissive image that's not at all the same, you know, as a, as a visible image and, uh, showing that that's possible. I think, um, yeah, the why now is to take that excitement, push it out and, uh, and, uh capture people's you, attention into a problem like this instead of a, you know, whatever the other problems are that are people are spending time on. Can this, you see? The, can, yeah. Can the you same image Daniel got up here. Yeah. Brent is like the one that made me really yeah. up to my probabilities. Yeah. Well, I love this, uh, yeah, you know, because to yeah. To... Well, first of all, people said you couldn't really ever see, you know, the, the ink and there it is. You, you can actually see it sometimes. We don't actually know why. But we know there's a lot of variability. It's all ancient stuff that's, you know, adulterated one way or another because they, there was no purity of anything in, in the time. What he's got here is on the right is uh, with the yellow lines on it is an infrared photo of a papyrus fragment. And the yellow lines are indicating very clearly where the, those were hand drawn on later, but they were indicating kind of where the ink can be photographed. Um, and so you have like this delta and then... I don't like my Greek letters are bad, but anyway, you've got, you know, you've got these letters here. I got the Delta for you. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, in the left side, that image is the CT scan. That's an image taken from mm -hmm. the slice of the CT scan. And it takes a second, sort of like those magic 3d images. But if you kind of stare at it, you can suddenly see actually the letters in there in the CT with the human eye. And like, once I saw this, I got, I got really excited because I thought, wow, this is the data is there. It's in the scans. Um, this is, this is going to work. And of course your model's proven. Yeah. Super cool. Um, what do you guys, uh, sort of think, um, just going through the website here, um, you know, Brent is someone who's been working on this problem for a long time. Um, what do you sort of think are going to be the, the sort of hardest parts, you know, if you were sort of teaching someone just how to get started. So, you know, they're an undergrad, um, they just started working on this issue. What are sort of the advice you'd give someone, you know, in the first few months or so of just how to think about this properly and how to set someone up for success? Yeah, well, uh, you know, Nat's, Nat and his team have put an enormous amount of work into getting this website to the place where the tutorials are, are visual and compelling and uh, step-by-step, -step, you know, leading 
leading you through uh, the complexity because there there is there is a lot of dimensionality, a lot of um, you know the way the images work, uh, which is different from from visible images. So I, I think probably getting your head around the geometry of everything is is the biggest right. thing. You know, it's all it's all three D and everything's wrapped up, and you know we do a certain amount of unwrapping and then reslicing and which dimension is that in and, you know, where is the data? Where's the signal? I think all of those things take some time, but then there is, my experience is that there is this aha moment where everything gels and you sort of realize, okay, I, I get all that, right? And this, yeah. the contestants who spend enough time to get to that point will succeed yeah. because that's the, the, the baseline for everything else that will follow. Brent, what yeah. is your, uh, what's your probability somebody actually wins the prize this year? Where would you put the number? Um, you know, I, I believe in the talent pool of the people we're talking to. And I've been amazed in the last year at what I've seen in terms of the development of uh, various techniques in, in AI and the success and, and even, you know, standard data sets being pushed forward. Um, given what we've already done and the fact that we've sort of laid out with, with Nat's help, uh, a pathway, a runway, if you will, I, I would put it over 90%. I really do think that, um, we have a shot here of opening up the whole thing and building building a definitive recipe. That's one of the things we haven't done is all of the ablation tests of, you know, if we tweak this, did that get better? If we turn that knob, does that get worse? And I think having a bunch of folks working on this will help us do that work in, as a community. And then we'll discover as we hone in on which knobs actually are helping us, right? Uh, we'll discover the, the secret recipe. Um, if it turns out that sort of the open source community, uh, you know, which has produced, to be honest, the modern technological marvels that we all rely on, um, Unix computing, um, internet protocols and so forth. If it turns out that that same engine is also sort of capable of doing archeology, span um, at scale, and it's just not that hard once you get open source involved in it. Um, what are, you know, how do you think our lives will change? Like, are there other large sort of unsolved archeological mysteries um, that can be converted into data problems that then the sort of open source world can go out and solve? Um, what are other things like Herculaneum that you've sort of thought of, Brent? Well, certainly there's the remote sensing community working on finding new archeological sites that were uh, hitherto unknown. Right. There's also the diffusion you know, through various time periods, the movement of goods and services and people uh, that, that is hard to understand, but I think with more data and at scale, you start to get a picture of things that happened that were har harder to, to obtain, you know, without that data. I think those are, those are two areas. And, you know, not to be too self-referential, but I think that just conserving what we have that, that, that's a big problem all on its own. Like, um, how are things, uh, decaying and right. what do we need to do environmentally to slow that down as much as we can? And, uh, it's another great sort of machine learning thing where we can make all the measurements and then we can sort of understand and then tune how to preserve what we have. Right. Do you sort of think, uh, you know, as we uncover more and more of the old world, um, how do you guys sort of think that may change sort of our understanding of, uh, of history? You know, I, I believe as an example, our knowledge of the vastness of the Egyptian empire is pretty young. Um, I think that is only 200 or 300 years old or so, um, that was forgotten in, and so if this really works and let's imagine we end up reading, you know, um, most scrolls from Herculaneum that haven't been distorted. Um, how, how do you sort of think our understanding of history will change? Are there, 
Are there ideas that you guys sort of suspect uh, might be true, um, things that may have been much bigger or much smaller than we currently think? What do you think, Nat? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm really extremely unqualified to comment on all of this. I'm just a carpetbagger who found Brent's project and got excited. And, you know, we both got excited about this, this contest idea, but I'm especially unqualified to comment about history. But I'll, I will anyway. Um, yeah. You know, I don't know. I get excited about I sort of found this during COVID. We were in lockdown. And uh, I think we all started behaving strangely in lockdown. A lot of people. Baking bread. Yeah. And, Your sourdough was uh, Herculaneum papyri. And well, I mean, I found, you know, Brent gave this talk at the Getty Center uh, several years ago. It's like this incredible talk. I mean, honestly, I've watched it several times before I met him. Um, and uh, we linked it on the website because it's so good. But, um, but I got, you know, I was just so moved by this. And I, I think there's a way in which these ideas, you know, everyone always kind of gets really excited about bigness like whether it's space or time you know these concepts of like you know astronomical distances or, or thousands of years are you know very somehow inspiring and comforting things and and you know most of what we know about history we know of ancient history we know through the writings which survived which are very few and uh, you can kind of think about like all the archaeological artifacts as the this communications channel from the past to the present and um there's a theory called the noisy channel coding theorem. It's also called the Shannon limit, which is this idea that there's a theoretical maximum amount of information that you can transmit over a communications channel, given a certain amount of random you know, entropy that you're adding to it, random noise that you're adding over time. And so I think as our technology improves, our understanding of the past will approach the Shannon limit for how much information we could possibly have about it. And I think it'll just make us feel closer to it in a way, you know, and uh, I think that in and of itself is interesting. I mean, one of the things that I think people like about reading about ancient places is a lot of it seems foreign, but there's a lot of ways in which, you know, you read the graffiti on a wall in Pompeii and it's like, wait, they were kind of just like us. <laughs> so I think it kind of makes it feel a little bit closer to. So there's no particular fact, I mean, that I'm hoping for, um, but anything that sort of has an impact and m makes all of that a little clearer, I think is going to be really exciting. Yeah, I mean, our window on the world is so short relative to the time scales and this idea of bigness. Uh, when you're talking about things that were written 2,000 years ago, far exceeding any single person's lifetime, uh, there just seems to be such a separation. And yet writing, you know, closes the gap instantly because you have a human author I, I, and an idea from an individual's head that now is coming into your head. And uh, that's actually one of my biggest um, concerns about things like chat GPT, et cetera, where we're, we're developing text that is not from a human. It's um, right. a melange, you know, of who knows what. And so now you can no longer trust that it actually is an idea that came from a human and now is going into your head. Right. And one thing, one of the things I love about this project is that it's using all of that technology or whatever people decide to use. But in the service of going back to the basic idea of what a text is, which is that a human wrote it and that we can read it and understand it, right? Yeah, that's yeah, it's really fair. true. You do, when you read certain people, even if it was a thousand years ago, you kind of feel like you know them and you might even know them better than you know people you work with every day in some cases or, you know, because they're really bringing you into their head. And uh, I think, yeah, like you can build that bridge across time. I think about it, Brandon, I'm sure you think about this too, but I think about that. I think, you know, there was that letter, um, the only firsthand account of the, uh, of the Vesuvius eruption was yeah. from uh, Pliny the Younger, who yep. described his uncle, Pliny the Elders. Um, and, you know, he, I guess he was in Naples across the bay when the eruption occurred. And he describes the eruption and what it looked like and how the kind of cloud that came out of the volcano looked like the, I think he said the top of a pine tree. and. Um, various sort of stages hour by hour of what happened with the ash and stuff. And he also describes the, his uncle's death, Pliny the Elder's death, how he kind of bravely got on a boat with, I think, some soldiers and they went, you know, into, uh, I think, to Pompeii and, and you know, didn't realize how dangerous it was. And he, you know, because the ashes were falling down and 
embers were falling. They tied pillows to their heads at one point. So it's this incredible firsthand account. But in it, there's some there's a phrase which I won't be able to reproduce exactly. But where he says uh, he he wrote these letters to a historian who was writing a history of important events and people, and asked him for in order to add it to his history for these accounts. And there's so there's a little preface in in Pliny the Younger's letter where he talks about just how important it is and how everyone strives to either do something which is significant enough to be written about or to write something which is remembered. And so like that was sort of in a way for these ancient Romans, I think one of the highest values was to have this like legacy and to live through history. So I think all the time about like, God, if they, if they knew how hard, you know, people were working, you know, Brent is working and, and people, you know, who are going to participate in this are going to work and the technologies that are going to be deployed and have been deployed just to immortalize their words, really, like, uh, that would blow their minds. <laughs> like, you know, like 2000 years from now, people will use, you know, the most advanced technologies ever created just to see what you had to say, um, and to preserve that forever on the internet. Um, if the internet's forever, uh, I guess we'll find out maybe we won't, but yeah, I think that would have been maybe the highest achievement they could have ever hoped for in some, in some wild way. Yeah. The preservation of our heritage. Um, Brent, um, I presume, you know, as people sort of go through working on this, you know, maybe if they've gotten hooked by the story, um, by the potential sort of upside, if it works, it, you know, could plausibly be one of the great archeological discoveries of our lifetime and possibly all time. Um, but, um, I, I presume, you know, uh, like Einstein's famous quote, you know, um, he was just the most persistent, not the smartest. And, um, uh, I think you've probably been the smartest, but certainly the most persistent, uh, you know, on working on these scrolls. Um, what sort of kept you going? Um, cause I presume it's not been easy and there's been plenty of setbacks and so I'm sort of curious to hear like why, you know, why yeah. continue to push on these? Yeah, well, yeah, I'm certainly not the smartest. I mean, I I realized that a long time ago, but uh, you can make up for that with persistence. And uh, really, what's kept me going is a very deep belief that it actually is solvable with technology. Like, I mean, if I had come to the point where I I truly believed it was an, an impossible problem, I think I would have moved on to try to find a solvable problem. But there have been enough, uh, you know, breakthroughs along the way and and getty was a huge one um because there are a lot of moving parts here virtual unwrapping is one one piece just managing the geometry of something that's all wrapped up um and and now you know managing the the limits of the imaging technology to be able to pull back a signal right that's diminished because you have to have a diminished technique in order to you know do the penetrating thing because you can't open it up physically that the belief, the strong belief, which I've always had that there would be a, a solution and that it's there and that I just need to find it. And I think actually that's a, that's, you guys are, you guys are engineers, you're scientists, you, you feel the same way, I'm sure. I mean, when you think yeah. of a problem and you believe that there actually is a solution and you're on it, you're not going to stop, right? Because you're going to yeah. find it. And that's what we do. That's how we're wired. So. I think that alone is really the thing. Now, when you add in all of the mystery and, and, you know, there's no question that as an engineer, I was completely hijacked and enamored with the historical aspect of this. And I have loved being able to broaden, you know, who I am and how I think based on, um, you know, the knowledge of what other people like Richard Janko have done and what these ancients have actually written about. So there's no question that, um, the, the richness of that also added, added impetus. So, yeah. Makes sense. Um, so, um, do you guys have sort of, um, any broad advice for people who are thinking of working on this in terms of, uh, infrastructure or tools or community they need beyond the website? I mean, that the, the website's a pretty good overview. Do you have of any final tips on where to send people and yeah. things they should be looking at? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, first, movies they should be watching, uh, books they should be reading. Um, definitely. I mean, like, like I said, uh, this has been an amazing rabbit hole to fall into, partly because there is so much amazing material 
And a lot of it was produced over the years by Brent's team. And we've tried to excerpt some really excellent explanatory parts and put them on scrollprize.org. Um, but part of the fun of this is just figuring out how much is out there and, and reading it. So, yeah, so first go to scrollprize.org. I mean, um, the JP and the, you know, and, and Brent's uh, group, you know, everyone's worked really hard to put together some amazing tutorials. And um, we hired some really awesome animators to try to make some of the more difficult to understand yeah. concepts a little more accessible. And they're really fun. <laughs> and uh, I think cool to see. Um, and so, yeah, go through those. And then I would say um, the Kaggle notebook is quite good. It's, it's pretty cool in 100 lines of code to be able to demonstrate a proof of concept of the ink detection from CT scan. So definitely check that out. And then we've got a Discord, which is linked off the website. And, um, you know, there's a couple of us in there kind of full time ready to support anybody who wants to work on this and answer questions and um, pr provide better tools. Um, I do think one of the bigger challenges of working on this is the size of the data. and. Um, you know, so the, the CT scans of the full scrolls are big, uh, you know, each, you know, they're scanned at eight microns. And so the way that's stored on disk, I learned is that you're in these TIFF files, each of which represents a horizontal slice through the scroll. And so, you know, if you want a one centimeter worth of data, that's I, I, uh, 1,258 micron slices. And I think that's like a hundred. 50 gigs or something like that. So it's pretty big. So I do think one thing that, um, you know, Brent and his team have built great, some really great tools for working with this stuff, which are open source. And, you know, we've linked those, a uh, volume cartographer. And then there's some other cool um, open source tools like Mesh Lab and um, BG and, you know, which help you sort of explore some of these 3D spaces. Um, but gosh, you know, one of the things we're hoping is that people, you know, even if you don't think you've got the time to put in to go all the way and get the grand prize, just doing some better tools, you know, or improving the existing ones for visualization, or maybe people have ideas on how to subset the data in ways that are interesting um, or helpful. I think that would be a big contribution by itself. Um, yeah. yeah, I totally agree. And we have eight microns because it was the best we could get, but we don't know that we actually need all that. So there are some open questions, but what I would say is, so people should not be afraid to defy the conventional wisdom. I mean, I've been trying to do that my whole time. So people said, and Getty was a fluke because the ink had probably some dense metal in it. And so that worked, but it was kind of an accident and nothing else with carbon ink is ever going to work. But we're showing that that's actually not true. Tomography contains a lot of information uh, that you can't see, but you can elicit. So. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean the signal's not there, right? And it goes back to the Shannon channel and everything else. Um, I think defying conventional wisdom, asking the question anyway, a lot of times researchers like me, you know, we get on the train, the rails go where the rails go, we ride that train. Uh, this is a chance for a lot of people to sort of school us on some ideas we haven't thought of and maybe demonstrate that conventional wisdom is wrong and there's a better way. And I'm excited that that might happen. Well, if technology showed us uh, anything, it's often the triumph of uh, random outsiders um, with unconventional ideas. I mean, I guess that's much of the history of scientific discovery, too. And so uh, if that happens here, um, I think we'll uh, all be happy to see it. Um, Brent, uh, thank you for your work. I mean, uh, if this works, I mean, you will go down in history. If this really works, I mean, you might go down in history as sort of one of the uh, Im most important um, researchers, archaeology researchers uh, of our species. And, um, you know, not obviously uh, you and the team put together an awesome uh, way to sort of connect really the open source world, like to this ancient problem. And, um, and yeah, hopefully this was a nice way for people to sort of get to know you guys and get to hear the problem. And um, I guess if folks have any questions, there's a bunch of, uh, activity on discord is that right Nat? yeah that, yeah you can find it's us there internet yeah. solution yeah. yeah it's not every day you get to work on a 
300 year old puzzle. I mean, maybe, actually it's every day for Brent, but for everybody else. Right? <laughs> Look, honestly, has, has there ever been a more exciting time where we can even have this conversation the way we're having it and, you know, work together collectively the way we are uh, on a problem. I mean, it's just really exciting, you know, the scaffolding that we have. And uh, I want to, I want to use it to good effect. Great note to end on. Thank you. Thanks.